Hello everyone, this is Carol Ireton Jones. I'm a registered dietitian and consultant in private practice. I'm happy to bring you this webinar today, Indirect Calorimetry and Energy Expenditure. Should we guess or should we measure? The objectives are as follows, to evaluate components of energy expenditure in adults, to understand the measurement of energy expenditure using indirect calorimetry, and to discuss the applications of energy expenditure assessment across the continuum of care. Energy expenditure is the sum total of voluntary and involuntary energy expenditure in a day. Energy is expended in the human body for microprocesses such as active transport, synthesis of macromolecules, and muscle contractions. What affects energy expenditure? Age, younger versus older, gender, male versus female, body surface area or height and weight, activity, size, stature, race, and other things including climate and smoking. Some of these have a large effect and some have a smaller effect on overall energy expenditure. Components of total energy expenditure, or TEE, or sometimes called daily energy expenditure, include basal metabolic rate, which is about 60 to 80 percent of total energy expenditure, resting metabolic rate, which is approximately 10 percent above basal metabolic rate, and really represents 60 to 75 percent of total energy expenditure in free living people. Then it added to that is the thermic effect of food, which is an increase of about 6 to 10 percent above uh, the resting metabolic rate. Then the last two, activity and, and or disease or illness, these vary. First, let's discuss basal energy expenditure or basal metabolic rate. It is the minimum amount of energy expended that is compatible with life. It reflects the amount of energy used over 24 hours while physically and mentally at risk at rest in a thermoneutral environment that prevents the heat generating activities of exercise and other processes even shivering. You can imagine that this would be very difficult to measure. If I was going to measure this in one of my patients, I'd have to have a key to their house and go to their home and write as they are waking up, just wake them up in a, hopefully they were in a thermoneutral environment and had no stresses, nothing on their mind, and I would measure their basal metabolic rate. But that's not very easy to do and not really something that we use in clinical practice. So what we measure in clinical practice is resting metabolic rate. You may see that as REE -E as well. As you can see from this slide, this is the energy expended in the activities necessary to sustain normal body functions and homeostasis. It includes these items here, respiration and circulation, synthesis of organic compounds, energy required by the central nervous system. Each of these are involuntary energy expenditure. In fact, 60% of resting metabolic rate can be accounted for by the heat produced by the liver, brain, heart, and kidneys. And so that's heat produced, or we can call that energy expenditure as well. So RMR, or REE, is what we can measure. It is about 10% above BMR, and it accounts for somebody being awake and potentially traveling to the site to have their energy expenditure measured. The next component of energy expenditure is the thermic effect of food. This is called TEF. It could be called diet-induced thermogenesis. It could be called specific dynamic action. So any one of these are a definition of the increase in energy expenditure associated with the consumption, digestion, and absorption of food. And this accounts for up to 10% of the total energy expenditure. It can be as low as 6% and as, or as high as 10%. The thermic effect of food is increased more with a high protein meal compared to a high fat meal, but remember it's still within this 10% increase above resting metabolic rate. 
Fat is metabolized efficiently with only 4% wastage compared to about 25% wastage when carbohydrate is converted to fat for storage. The thermic effect of food decreases after ingestion of food over two to four hours, and this depends on the size of the meal. So a, a lower calorie meal of around 300 calories, the thermic effect, this increase above resting metabolic rate, may be complete after two to three hours. A higher energy containing meal may be four hours or more. Spicy foods do enhance and prolong the effect of the thermic effect of food. So meals with chili and mustard may increase the metabolic rate as much as 33% more than unspiced meals. And this effect may, be, may last for more than three hours. But this important point is that this is short-lived and in reality, this is a small number of calories. If your RMR was 1,200 calories, then for three hours, a 33% increase will give you a total of additional 50 calories per day. Other factors also affect energy expenditure. Endocrine disorders, i.e. hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism, may affect energy expenditure if untreated. Emotional excitement or stress can increase energy expenditure. There's an increase in energy expenditure in pregnancy. This is uh, smaller at the first trimester, increasing over each trimester. Butte and colleagues in Houston estimated for the first trimester, there's about a 90 calorie per day increase in energy expenditure. For the second trimester about a 300 calorie per day increase in energy expenditure and for the third trimester around 450 calories uh, increased in energy expenditure per day. So that um, can average out to around 450 calories um, per day. Again more at the second and third trimester. All of this is a goal to gain about 24 pounds. There's also an increase in energy expenditure for lactation, and this has been estimated to require four to 500 extra calories per day, or an increase in energy expenditure of about 400 to 500 uh, calories per day. For postmenopausal females, there is actually a decrease in RMR due to the loss of post-ovulation increase in resting metabolic rate. So postmenopausal puzzle females may have a decrease in their resting metabolic rate of 15,000 to 20,000 calories per year that first year. However, that is only around 41 to 55 calories per day. Other factors. Other factors that it may increase energy expenditure and ca include caffeine, nicotine, alcohol, and fevers. But it is important to note with any of these that these are short-lived. For example, caffeine may increase your energy expenditure up to, um, as you see here, 11% or 15%, but on average it's around 6%. And it depends on the amount of caffeine taken in, and the 6% increase may last for four hours. Nicotine also increases resting metabolic rate, and this increases a uh, lasts for approximately 2.5 hours. Fevers do increase resting metabolic rate and from this old data from 1930, it was estimated that resting metabolic rate is increased by 7% for each degree of increase in body temperature above normal. But again, this is should be short-lived because this should be treated. A high temperature is not something that is usually associated with health. Activity or the energy expended in activity is very difficult to estimate. It's the most variable component of total energy expenditure and for some people who do very little in a day they may increase their energy expenditure only a approximately 100 calories. An elite athlete may increase their energy expenditure by 3,000 calories or more per day, per day. So this is quite a challenge in estimating energy needs for individuals. 
Looking at this schematic, you can see that we've talked about many of the things that are associated with energy expenditure. And really, uh, physical activity turns out to be the biggest challenge and biggest variable. But if this is a normal individual, if you gain weight, then you either need to increase your decrease your calories or increase your physical activity. If you're losing weight, then you need to increase your energy expenditure. The challenge comes when this is replaced by disease or injury. So if you do have a disease or injury, we must account for the increase or potentially decrease in energy expenditure because of this injury or disease. It again becomes difficult to estimate the number of calories that are associated with any diagnosis. As you see here in this slide, in cancer, it, this is an old slide, but this continues to hold true today. Energy expenditure cannot be accurately estimated in patients with cancer. Metabolic rate varies. Similarly with liver disease, COPD, and even pressure ulcers. So what do we do? We try to predict how many calories our patients need. We use energy expenditure equations. Energy expenditure equation factors usually include height, they include body weight, they include age and gender. Noting here, height should be measured, but oftentimes it is estimated. Body weight should be measured as well. Some people use an ideal body weight, but as you can see here, if I'm 5'4 and a female, my ideal body weight is 120 pounds, whether I am old or young, fit or not fit. So body weight also needs to be measured. If it cannot be measured, then it causes the energy expenditure equation to be inaccurate. Components of body weight that would be nice to be measured are fat mass and fat free mass, but often this is not available and may not be included in an energy expenditure equation. Finally, age and gender should be accounted for. The effect of resting metabolic rate on energy expenditure is usually due to the effect of both age and gender in the variation in fat mass and fat-free mass and therefore weight. Adjusted body weight has been used for estimating the body weight to be used in an energy expenditure equation for an overweight or obese individual. As you see here, the data behind this is a newsletter that was published in 1984. This equation has been used, but it has no data behind it. And so you should do as this dietitian is doing to her patient, and that is she is measuring her actual body weight to use in the energy expenditure equation. There is an equation that is used primarily in the outpatient setting. I use it in my practice. It can be used for healthy individuals. It's the Mifflin-St. Jor equation. It was considered new, but as you can see, it's from 1990, so it's actually almost a 30-year-old equation. However, it has a large number of patient individuals, healthy individuals, in the equation, almost 500, and there were several who had a BMI greater than 30. This is the Mifflin-St. Jor equation. It uses weight, actual weight, height, and age to estimate resting metabolic rate in healthy individuals. Energy expenditure equations in critical care have many factors that may influence resting metabolic rate. Height, weight, age, gender may also may affect resting metabolic rate. We know that. Also, minute ventilation, if the patient is ventilator dependent, body temperature, again, whether they're ventilator dependent or spontaneously breathing, the type of nutrition support they're receiving, if they're septic, so these are just some of the many factors that influence resting metabolic rate. So applying a prediction equation developed for normal healthy subjects to critically ill patients 
will likely result in significant errors. This equation uh, I developed in 1992. It's still used for a assessing or estimating energy expenditure in hospitalized patients. There are two equations, one for ventilator dependent patients, one for spontaneously breathing patients. In the evidence analysis library of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, the 1992 version was recommended to be used and it is here with the reference listed here as well. Because this is was developed from indirect calorimetry measurements of individuals who were in the presence of their disease or injury, it estimates their actual total energy expenditure. So no additional factor is added for activity or injury. Another equation that is used for hospitalized patients is the Penn State equation as you see here. For obese patients who are a bit of a conundrum. There are three equations that have been recommended. Some recommend using 25 calories per kilogram using actual um, or usual current body weight. Some recommendations are 15 to 20 calories per kilogram using actual body weight. It has been recommended to use the Arrington Jones equation or the Penn State equation. And then finally, has been, this equation has been used, the hypocaloric high protein feeding, where you pre determine the patient's resting metabolic rate and you give them about 50% of those calories, which again, that turns out to be this 14 to 20 calories per kilo, but you do give them adequate protein using their ideal body weight as the factor. Well, as you can see, there's many problems with those equations. So how can we determine actual energy expenditure? Energy expenditure can be measured from respiratory gas exchange. Oxygen is consumed in every energy producing reaction. CO2 is produced and this occurs in the Krebs cycle. So if we can determine the actual oxygen consumption and CO2 production, then we will know the number of calories this patient requires or healthy individual for that matter. The Weir equation is used to plug in these measured numbers, oxygen consumption and CO2 production. Also, if you know the amount of oxygen consumed and CO2 produced, CO2 produced, then you will be able to understand what metabolic substrates are being utilized by calculating respiratory quotient, which I'll show you in a moment. This is the Weir equation. The abbreviated Weir equation is used most often now as urinary nitrogen is rarely available and fraught with inaccuracy. So this is the equation that is used. Most metabolic cards or indirect calorimeters have this equation already programmed in. So there's no need for you to memorize it, but it's a good one to know. So you know what your metabolic cart is calculating from. Some indirect calorimeters measure oxygen consumption only and they use an equation that assumes an RQ of 0.83. Respiratory quotient RQ is the ratio of oxygen consumed to CO2 produced. So that's VCO2 over VO2. So for fat, the RQ is 0.7 and all the way up to carbohydrate is 0.95 to 1. For a mixed diet, which most people have, the RQ is about 0.85. If the RQ is above 1, that may indicate overfeeding or net fat synthesis. And if the RQ is significantly over 1, as you see here, 1.1, that likely indicates hyperventilation and you will not have an accurate test. If the RQ is below, 0.6 or below, that may indicate ketosis. So how are metabolic, how are these indirect calorimetry measurements made? They are made using what we call an indirect calorimeter or a metabolic measurement cart.
There are larger versions. They measure oxygen consumption, CO2 production, respiratory quotient, and of course resting metabolic rate. They may measure pulmonary function as well. Many are connected to a ventilator or as a component of a ventilator. They're expensive and they require experienced personnel to operate and calibrate these as well. And they're usually not very portable. There are portable indirect calorimetries. They measure indirect calorimeters, measuring oxygen consumption and determining resting metabolic rate. These small ones, as you see pictured here, which is the review, is they are they, this one is portable, lightweight, and self-calibrating, and it's been clinically validated against Douglas bag and existing metabolic carts. It is used with spontaneously breathing patients only, and as you can see here, she's got nose, nose clips and a mouthpiece to have her metabolic rate measured. Here's another example of what somebody would look like having their metabolic rate measured using the review. And as you can see, they're in a supine position. And I'll show you the measurement conditions in a moment. Is there evidence to support using indirect calorimetry instead of equations to estimate calorie requirements? That is, can resting metabolic rate be measured reliable? The answer is yes, under standard conditions to obtain a steady state RMR. How often should they be measured? For healthy individuals, you can measure them once in a 24-hour period. It's true as well for critically ill ventilated patients. You can measure them once in a 24-hour period if a steady state is achieved. How long is the measurement? One single 10-minute measurement should be adequate as long as you eliminate the first five minutes and the VO2 and VCO2 are within a 10% variation. If you'd like more information on this, I would like to refer you to the article by Fulmer and colleagues in the Journal of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics from 2015. Measurement conditions. This is very important to assure you have an accurate measurement. Before the resting metabolic rate measurement for adults, food should be limited or should be actually eliminated a fast for seven hours or four hours if a small meal has been uh, taken in. I measure most of my patients between 8 and 11 a.m. So that gives them time to have fasted overnight. Most everyone has. Caffeine, none for four hours. Nicotine, none for 2.5 hours. And exercise, none for four hours. Although there's not good data sh to show how long someone should refrain from exercise. I use this rule of force. No food, caffeine, nicotine, or exercise for four hours before the RMR measurement. And I've found this to be very acceptable to my clients and also provides reproducible data. Measurement conditions, the, the individuals that you measure have had to travel to your site. So I have my uh, clients come in and they rest before the RMR for about 20 to 30 minutes. So yes, they come into my office, they um, lie in a supine position, I turn off the light, I have a lamp on my desk, and they rest for 20 minutes. I time it. As far as gas collection devices, any gas collection device is fine. The ventilated hood and canopy is fine, mouthpiece and nose clip is fine, and a face mask is fine. I like the mouthpiece and nose clip. Uh, recently I had a man come in with a very nice beard and mustache, and that would have been very difficult to measure with a face mask. The ambient room temperature should be somewhere between 72 to 77 degrees. That is in a comfortable environment and you should have it quiet and there should be dim light. Once the rest period is over, you can start the test and I use the review so my tests are usually over in 10 minutes. Then they get the results. 
How many calories do I need? Well, as you see here, energy in to equal energy out should mean that you're in energy balance. So typically you do add an activity factor for the RMR. And this is the challenge. The RMR measurement is very exact. And then we add an estimated activity factor. I use 30% for almost all of the clients that I see. If you have somebody who is very active, they have an active child, uh, active job, they're a regular exerciser, they're a weekend warrior, then you may add 50% to their resting metabolic rate to get their total energy expenditure. For calories to cause weight gain, you can add 250 to 500 calories per day or subtract the same amount. But again, um, this is why they need to be monitored to make sure you're getting that right. Let's go through some case reports. This is a 60 year old female and I thought Carmen Diaz looks great for a 60 year old female. This female is six, 61 inches, 126 pounds. She's been on uh, weight loss diets most of her life. She's about 23% body fat. So her predicted resting metabolic rate would be 1,207 calories, but actually uh, her measured resting metabolic rate was 936 calories per day. What are your recommendations? Well, my recommendations to her were one, to increase her activity, but also to increase her energy intake. Still, she wanted to decrease her body weight, but I recommended that she take in at least 12 or 1300 calories per day. And my goal is to measure her again and see if by consistently increasing her intake and potentially building lean body mass, we can move her resting metabolic rate up. Yes, uh, George Clooney came to my office the other day. He's a 62-year-old male. This particular guy was 68 inches tall. He weighed 191 pounds. He had a BMI of 29.1. He started a strength training program and a weight loss program. His predicted resting metabolic rate was 1,500 calories approximately, but his measured was 1,700 calories. Six weeks later, he has lost uh, down to 183 pounds. So he's lost eight pounds, but he has gained muscle mass. His BMI is 27.5, and his predicted resting metabolic rate um, with the calorie change here was 1,541 calories per day, but his measured was actually 1,634. So although his metabolic rate has decreased, he has come more within what we would predict the normal range as noted by the mifflin saint Jor equation. And finally, a couple more. This is a 39-year-old male, 70 inches tall, weighed 200 pounds. His predicted was 1940 kcals per day, but his measured was 1613 calories per day. Another one, 44-year-old female, 69 inches tall, 169 pounds, BMI 25, right in that range of um, normal to overweight BMI. Her predicted was 1506 and her measured was 1512 calories per day. So as you can see, each one of these four individuals had varied metabolic rates. And the only way to be accurate would be to measure resting metabolic rate. So I would have been accurate with my prediction with 25% of these individuals, so one in four. So guessing doesn't always work. For disease state, illness, or injury, predicting these calories, the Aspen and SCCM guidelines state you should measure resting metabolic rate using indirect calorimetry. Resting metabolic rate, in this case, when it is measured under the presence of the disease state, the illness, or injury, likely includes the energy effects of disease or injury. 
what the clinician needs to do once you get this measurement is consider the patient's clinical status, what their fluid status is, their substrate tolerance, their nutrition status, as well as their nutrition goal, whether they in, are trying to provide nutrition support, that is just meet their needs, or metabolic support to meet um, specific needs. Then the dietitian or clinician can use this clinical information from the RMR to determine how many calories to give this patient. Resting metabolic rate has many applications to practice. In the outpatient setting, it can be a nice addition to a private practice, whether the individuals or your clients are looking for weight gain, for weight loss, or just weight management. Individuals can be billed directly and self-pay. Uh, insurance may be used, but it needs to be pre-authorized and approved. Or a clinician may just consider this a component of a nutrition consultation. So using 25 or 30 minutes for the testing and 25 minutes for the consult. It's applicable to weight management centers, to gyms, and it's also applicable to any outpatient setting, whether it's cancer, renal disease, etc., or home, enteral, or parenteral nutrition. In hospitals, I think it is absolutely necessary in the ICU and critical care because it's so difficult to look at a patient and try to figure out how many calories they need. In the outpatient setting in the hospital, it may be very useful for cardiac rehab or again, weight loss programs, bariatric surgery programs, etc. There are limitations of indirect calorimetry. One example would be poor equipment that was not calibrated, that was not standardized. So you must make sure you have a good uh, piece of equipment to measure metabolic rate. Unskilled personnel doing the test. You know, machines give data always. It all isn't always good data. So if you have somebody who weighs 200 pounds and their resting metabolic rate is 250 calories, something happened. Mo a good metabolic cart should tell you you had a problem with this test. Also, the lack of ability to interpret the data. I When I look at the data that I reviewed previously, Whatever the patient's resting metabolic rate is, is their resting metabolic rate. It doesn't mean they're abnormal. It doesn't mean they have a high metabolic rate or a low metabolic rate. It means that this is their metabolic rate based on their situation. So I think it's important to provide that interpretation with the data. There are challenges in ICU situations with ventilators, oxygen sources, oxygen sources, compliant patients. So those can be a challenge with metabolic carts that are applied to the ICU and clinical settings. One of the first questions that a patient or client will ask me as we begin to work on their nutrition goals. Well, how many calories should I take in? If you measure energy expenditure, this improves accuracy for you and for your client, and it allows you both to set clear and individualized goals. When you set these goals, they can be for maintenance, for weight loss, or for weight gain. But overall, it's important to monitor for success. Here are some selected references for you. And I'll be happy to answer questions. We will have a Q&A for the remaining time today. Thank you very much for your attention. And feel free to email me at the email you see here. Thank you very much. The question period is now open and you should be able to send in a question via your
um, computer, so please don't hesitate to do so. Before we do start with questions, there's a couple of things that I would like to just mention as I, I realized as I was speaking that this, I, I did misspeak on one thing. When I talked about the energy expenditure in pregnancy, I mentioned that it increases with each trimester. So I think it, um, as I mentioned, it was 90 calories for the first trimester, 300 approximately for the second, and 450 for the third trimester. And I averaged that to about 450 calories per trimester, and that would not be right. So it's average about 300 calories per day for the entire pregnancy, but again, um, it increases over each trimester to reach a goal of about a 24 pound weight gain. Another thing I just wanted to make sure was clear as we were talking about energy requirements and I mentioned that if you lose weight that you um, could increase your caloric intake and if you were gaining weight you could increase your energy expenditure but certainly you could also decrease your client's calorie level as well if you thought that they were doing very well with their um, overall program energy expenditure wise, they were having adequate activity. So we just might have overestimated the calories that they need. Um, but that's why it's so important to measure. Now I'd like to take some questions. The first question I see here is when I test morbidly obese patients, sometimes their measured resting metabolic rate is much higher than the predicted equation. Should I plan an intervention on the measurement, the predicted energy expenditure, or somewhere in between? This is such a great question. And I think it's so such a great question because if we are measuring a morbidly obese patient and we see that they have a high energy expenditure or resting metabolic rate, that is their energy expenditure, whether you're thin, whether you're normal weight, whether you're obese, whether you're morbidly obese, when we measure your energy expenditure, that is your resting metabolic rate. That is that patient's energy expenditure. So it, it, it's also important to know with the obese that they're not just their body composition is not just an increase in body fat, it is an increase in lean body mass as well because it does take um, muscle to carry around the additional uh, body size, which is body fat increased as well. So the answer is if you measure a patient and their resting metabolic rate is around 2,600 calories, you may not want to give that 2,600 calories back to that patient. But that's where you as the clinician make a decision as to what that patient needs. I, I use this in my outpatient setting to take, to demonstrate to individuals that you may think you were eating less, but this is the number of calories you take in at rest to maintain your body weight. So you may think you were only eating about 1,500 calories, but it was probably more like 2,600 calories. If this is an ill or injured patient, then this is where you may want to consider using the um, 14 to 20 calories per kilo or giving them 50% of their resting metabolic rate and then assuring that they're getting adequate protein. The next question that has come up is, um, let me see, how would a woman's menstrual cycle influence resting metabolic rate? Would it be higher in any particular phase? And it might be higher in, um, um, and I can't remember if it's the luteal phase or the ovulatory phase, but it might be slightly increased. It the overall increase might be around 30 to 50 calories per day. So I think you're okay in measuring an individual of a female of menstrual age at any time 
because you will be adding calories for activity. Uh, I love this question. The next question is the Harris-Benedict equation still used. Um, the Harris-Benedict equation is now going to celebrate 100 years, but uh, it is still used by some individuals because they've gotten used to using it. It's an important point to think about. If you if you um, have this energy equation that you use and it is working for you uh, as far as repeatability and applicability, then you certainly can continue to use that. But knowing that the Harris-Benedict equation was not developed from anyone who remotely represents people today that I think you definitely should um, consider using the um, Mifflin-St. Jor equation. At least it's only 30 years old and not uh, almost 100 years old. Uh, I do know there's a few more questions, and I'm just trying to get to these, so um, bear with me one moment, and I will see if we have any more. Uh, okay, here's another question. Given that ethnicity plays a role in RMR as it pertains to the predictive normal of the core review, what is the collective ethnicity of the predictive value. So again, uh, this is, it is very interesting. If you are someone who is very interested in um, understanding resting metabolic rate, you probably have looked into this. And this is what is so important when you're using a predictive equation. If you are using a predictive equation, where did it come from? Did it come from a group of 12 people, of 20 people? Were they ethnically the same? Was it a diverse population? So um, if you don't know that about the equation that you use, then you're just making an assumption. That's why I think with the ability to measure metabolic rate, you certainly obviate the effects of all of these outliers. So um, what I would tell you is to look at the equation you use. If you're using an energy equation, don't just accept it. Definitely, I would like, I, I would suggest you go back and look at the data from this study. And if you do, then you'll be able to see if your equation is applicable. There have been some smaller studies that looked at energy expenditure in the Asian population. Um, there are some with African Americans. So again, um, go back and if that's your primary population, take a look at that if you are using an energy expenditure equation. This is a great question. Um, at what point does someone eat to their resting metabolic rate so we will see weight loss? Do you ever recommend eating under a resting metabolic rate measurement? So typically, if I have somebody that I'm working with that is on a weight reduction diet, I may or may not start them at their resting metabolic rate. I may start them at a smaller increase, maybe 10% above their resting metabolic rate. But it does make a difference what their activity is. So if you have someone who is not going to be able to increase their activity right away, then you may want to start them at their resting metabolic rate or maybe 10% above that and determine if they can be successful on this. If it is someone who is going to be active, then you may want to do the prediction of energy expenditure times 1.3 and then um, 
remove 300 to 500 calories. That's one of the things that we do in practice. But again, that's why monitoring is so important. Another question was, how often do you measure healthy patients? I actually, um, it, I think it, that very much depends. I measure my healthy patients um, usually only um, initially and on follow-up if I need to, but I don't always uh, measure them on a regular basis. But um, if you have someone who has a long way to go with their energy, with their weight loss, then I think it's great to measure them again to make sure that you're maintaining um, a, their resting metabolic rate. What about someone whose RMR is 2,800 calories? How can we guide this patient to, or this person to help them lose weight? Well, in this case, you likely have a morbidly obese patient, or you may have um, a young person um, who has a, um, who's maybe very tall. It, it depends on um, really the body surface area of the patient. It depends on what you're trying to what your goal is. If it's a morbidly obese person and their RMR is 2,800 calories, then you, you might want to decide that you're going to start them at 2,500 calories, 2,200 calories. That may sound like a lot, but remember, you've got someone who is has a high resting metabolic rate simply because of their body composition. So this is a patient or a person, client, client, person, patient, whichever you like to call them, that you need to carefully monitor and assure that they are being successful. When in the ICU, patients are being continuously fed, we don't feel comfortable with holding feeding for prolonged periods of time to perform a study. What are your thoughts on this? Thank you for that question. That's a great question. If I have a patient who is receiving 24-hour um, tube feeding, if they're receiving 24-hour parenteral nutrition, if they're an ICU patient, then I say you can measure them at any time in the ICU. Two things we use, we don't want them to be immediately following chest physiotherapy or a physical therapy session. Other than that, you should be able to uh, measure them at any time. And again, if they're getting a 24-hour feeding because they're in the intensive care unit, then that will that obviates the need for you to add any calories for thermic effect of food. But as I mentioned in the ICU patient, there really isn't a need to add additional calories because their measured energy expenditure will be likely what they need. Um, you will see, um, you need to evaluate things like as mentioned, are they tolerating the substrates? Maybe they actually cannot take the number of calories you've measured because they're having challenges with substrate utilization at this time. Um, fluid status. Um, remember that during the time that a patient is in the ICU, this is not the time that you can do much in the way of repletion. So you're trying to manage the patient as they are and maintain their lean body mass. How do you get your long-term dieting patients to buy into the need to increase calories? Well, um, I think this is why I have, um, I like having access to measured energy expenditure because it goes along with this, this person that was my first case report. Her predicted was around 1200 calories but her measured was 936 calories. So she 
told us that she had been an a on again, off again dieter for most of her life. So allowing her to uh, increase her her energy expenditure, but also increase her calories while continuing to um, lose weight as far as losing weight in um, losing fat body fat, but gaining lean body mass is, is really important. So that's one of the ways that I talk to my clients about this. And if you do have the opportunity or the ability to measure um, body composition, that can help uh, be instructive as well to your clients where you can see that their energy expenditure is uh, lower than we may might have expected, but it's there, so it's normal, and their body fat might be higher than we expected. So um, those things help as, and are especially useful in a weight management program. Is it true that as you lose weight, uh, you lose muscle mass because the REE is, and therefore the REE or resting metabolic rate is going to decrease? Ooh, that's, that's, that's such a good question. And that is, I believe, why it's so important for people who are trying to lose weight to work with a qualified professional because you want people to lose weight, but you also want them to maintain their lean body mass. So appropriate exercise, appropriate diet prescription, and if you have this, you should. The goal is to maintain your resting energy expenditure, resting metabolic rate. Now, if you have a significant number of, uh, of pounds to lose, your metabolic rate may decrease as well. But just going you know, going on these diets where you decrease your calories to five or 600 calories um, can definitely decrease resting metabolic rate. And while you may lose weight um, quickly, it will not be sustainable. Okay, last question um, due to time. Um, when measured energy expenditure is lower than predicted for a new patient that comes in for weight loss, what are the possible explanations? Well, I, I, when I measure resting metabolic rate on my clients, and I don't do it for everyone, but when I um, do it for my clients, uh, it could be for weight loss. It might be somebody that just wants to see what their metabolic rate is. And my explanation is always the same, no matter whether it's weight loss, weight gain, weight maintenance. The predicted equations take in height, weight, age, and gender. And they're from a, we try to get those equations such as Mifflin, St. Jor, that are a, a wide variety of people, but there's always a bell curve and there'll be some people on the high end and some people on the low end compared to that equation. But the bottom line is what I measure and what is measured is that individual's energy expenditure. So that is the that is them. So I, I always say, for example, um, that George Clooney, that is your resting metabolic rate because I measured you. It's not an estimate from a population, it's you. So that's where we work from, what your energy expenditure is. Well, with that, I would like to um, wrap up this session on resting metabolic rate. I hope that you have taken away that resting metabolic rate can be very useful in your practice. If you're not using um, indirect calorimetry, then certainly use an equation that is applicable to your population, whether it's healthy individuals or it is hospitalized patients. Thank you very much for the opportunity to visit with you today. And again, um, my email is here and I'd like to also thank uh, my colleagues at Core Medical. Thank you very much.